Welcome everyone to the November 2023 Medical Research Future Fund webinar. I'm Marsha Somi, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Health and Medical Research Office. Um, and I'm really pleased today to be co-hosting with the wonderful Caroline Homer, who's the Deputy Chair of our board, the, the board that advises the Medical Research Future Fund uh, for providing advice to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Uh, before we begin the webinar, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we're all joining from today. Um, I'm joining from Noonawal and Nambri um, country here in the Canberra region. However, acknowledge that there are many lands um, that we're all joining from today as this is a video conference. So today's webinar is about how MRFF priorities are set and then can be enacted through MRFF funding opportunities and grant applications. The MRFF is a priority led funder and our focus is on addressing the priorities of consumers and health workers through research. This webinar provides advice for researchers on how to engage with these priorities. And it also focuses on the important role of consumers and those with lived experience, um, the role they can play in priority setting, and also in how research addressing these priorities is designed and then implemented. Uh, so this is today's, uh, the outline of today's presentation. I'm joined by a really wonderful panel, as I mentioned, uh, co-hosting with Professor Caroline Homer, who's the Deputy Chair of our board. Um, and she'll talk about how Medical Research Future Fund priorities are set. We also have Professor Marie Thiessen and Shannon Calvert, who will talk about priority setting in two uh, MRFF initiatives and activities, the Million Minds Mental Health Research Mission, and the Childhood Mental Health Research Plan. Also joined by Associate Professor Jackie McDonald and Professor Michael Burke, and together they and Shannon Calvert will talk about how research projects can be designed and implemented around these priorities. So I'll ask each panel member to introduce themselves as they begin their presentations. We'll also take questions at the end of the presentation. Um, you should be able to see um, a little bar called Slido where you can enter your questions. And there's also uh, an opportunity to like any of the questions that you think are great. Um, I'll use the number of likes to help prioritise which questions to ask um, the panel at the end of the session. So as I said, today's uh, session is about how MRFF priorities are set and can be enacted through research. At the very top of this process are the Australian Medical Research and Innovation Strategy and Priorities, and they're set by our board, the Australian Medical Research Advisory Board, and they're actually provided to Parliament. They're actually legislative instruments that are tabled and provided to Parliament. The Minister for Health and Aged Care must consider the priorities when he's making investment decisions through the Medical Research Future Fund. So they're absolutely key and critical uh, process and documents supporting the implementation of the Medical Research Future Fund. So AMRAB, in, in doing this work, uh, pr producing the strategy and the priorities, undertake a, a national consultation. Um, and the strategy is provided every five years and the priorities are updated every two years. Uh, another really important priority document for the Medical Research Future Fund is our 10-year investment plan. So the current one is our second 10-year investment plan. And that document is the document that articulates the strategy and priorities um, into a funding plan that's then used by the Health and Medical Research Office to run funding opportunities through the Medical Research Future Fund. And the current plan provides $6.3 billion over 10 years through 21 initiatives, each of which maps to the priorities that were set by our board. So I'll now hand over to Professor Caroline Homer and She'll talk about the, the um, current Australian medical research and innovation priorities. Great. Thank you so much, Marsha, and a very warm welcome to you all joining this afternoon. I'm joining from Wiradjuri land um, in Melbourne, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. So these were the priorities that were developed in late 2021, um, and they are for 2022 to 2024, so we'll be embarking on a similar process that I'm just about to describe to you next year. You always think two years is a long time, but it suddenly comes around. So at the end of uh, 2021, um, the Office of the Health and Medical Research 
group in, in the Department of Health developed a discussion paper um, with AMRAB, the, the, consul, the advisory board that I'm deputy chair of. We looked at the priorities from the previous two years. We also looked at the key health issues facing Australians and also the disease burden. Where are the key issues um, that, are, that are needing to be addressed? Of course, this was um, halfway through COVID uh, of those first um, emergency couple of years. So uh, we did most things online in terms of the consultation. But a discussion paper was released and then we undertook consultation um, over a month in October 2021. And Many people were invited to submit their thoughts around the discussion paper and also their thoughts around what the priorities should be. And of course, that included universities, MRIs, professional colleges, the biotech sector, commercialization sector, and of course, uh, consumers and carer groups. And we had about 250 submissions, which was just fantastic. It just shows how engaged people are around this important issue. We also had a public webinar that explained the process and we had a series of roundtables that were invited roundtables um, addressing key areas. So that uh, resulted in a long list of priorities that were then the office then bunched them together and did some synthesis. Uh, AMRAB, um, the, the advisory board looked at those. AMRAB also includes the CEO of NH and MRC, so there's really nice synergies there between the priorities for MRFF and the potential um, target areas for NH and MRC going forward. And, and then we came up with this list that you're seeing on the screen, and the list um, was then presented to the Minister of Health and um, was signed off in early 2022. So. This is the list we're working with at the moment. As you can see, it's some of these topics are pretty broad. Um, and so while they are trying to focus health and medical research on these areas, there's also, I think, quite a lot of scope within them um, that, that we'll talk about over the next hour anyway. So I hope that gives you an idea of how we went about actually doing this. Um, there is a process. It happens every two years. Um, and then there's a there's an opportunity when we do it again to reflect and, and reconsider. So I'll hand over to Marsha now. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, so the priorities that Caroline talked through apply to the whole of the MRFF um, and the next level of priorities are set at the initiative level. Uh, these are the 21 initiatives uh, that I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the 10-year investment plan. So eight of the 21 initiatives are research missions, um, and these eight research missions address areas of unmet need or areas of transformational potential, such as genomics. Um, we've also had some investments in some of our other initiatives that are very um, in, into priority areas, and one of these is childhood mental health, and, and Marie and, and Shannon will be able to talk about uh, both the Million Minds Mental Health Mission, but also our childhood mental health uh, research investment. So for both the missions and our priority investment areas, we have independent expert advisory panels that are appointed by the Minister for Health to provide him with advice. Um, on the research investments that are required to generate meaningful change in care and outcomes. So I'll hand over to Professor Marie Thiessen. Um, she was the chair of the Million Minds uh, Mental Health Research Mission Expert Advisory Panel that worked to establish an implementation plan. Thank you so much, Marsha. And um, <clears throat> it's a delight to be here today and to talking talk to everyone about the uh, my role in being a chair of an expert advisory panel. Uh, so I'm Professor Marie Thiessen and I was um, asked to chair the Million Minds Mission EAP. And I am joining you from the wonderful um, lands of the Kamirigal people. Um, I was also asked to be a member of the Childhood Mental Health Research Plan um, expert advisory panel. Um, so. I wanted to just give a few words on um, how the process works with um, expert advisory panels. And hopefully then when you read the research missions and implementation plans from those um, 
missions, you'll be able to see how they were um, developed. So um, like all expert advisory panels, the Million Minds panel included a range of stakeholders. So we had outstanding world leading researchers. We had um, extraordinary clinicians. We had amazing people with lived experience and Shannon will speak um, more to this um, in the next uh, little section. Um, and we also had Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, leaders on the expert advisory panel for the Million Minds mission. So importantly, it brought all those people together um, with diverse expertise and experience to really hothouse and debate um, the investment for the future um, in the area of uh, mental health research as funded through the Million Minds mission. Um, we also considered priority populations, communities, First Nations, culturally and um, linguistically uh, diverse. And um, this also was reflected in the research plans and the implementation plans where the targeted objectives are um, also framed around priority populations. So um, in addition, in uh, Million Minds mission, we also considered emerging issues and rem remembering that we were developing this in the time of major changes in trends and um, issues with COVID-19. So why is there a Million Minds uh, mission? Well, the mission supports research to improve mental health by translating research outcomes into practice. And more than 4 million Australians, um, adult Australians will experience a mental um, illness each year. And rates of mental health problems amongst young Australians, children are also extraordinarily high. So there's significant disease burden in this area. So the really big aim of the Million Minds mission is to address um, the impact of this on people's lives and to reduce this burden. Um, the research mission supports research that addresses that addresses, sorry, key national mental health priorities. And we were um, very strongly linked to other research. Um, priority setting processes, particularly the National uh, Mental Health Research Strategy, which is a very large undertaken, undertaking uh, by um, leaders in the mental health space, um, which uh, summarised um, the research strategy um, for mental health. So there's connections across and that was, um, of course, taken into account. And we're really hoping to improve the lives of um, one million people who might not otherwise benefit from mental health research. So I was also asked to just give a really, um, oh, and I'm seeing in the chat that people are saying they can't hear. So I'm going to plow on, but I'm hoping that um, that's being addressed. Um, I was asked to give an example of um, how the MRFF expert advisory panels takes into account the incredible priorities that um, Caroline outlined. And I just want to give it one standout example. Um, and I'm hoping for those online, I can bring your attention to this because I think it is a really key thing that comes out of the um, missions and um, it's one standout example for me, and that was in strengthening capacity. So a key priority of the MRFF is strengthening health and medical researcher capacity and capability. And that was along the bottom of the slide that um, Caroline just presented. So this also emerged as a key theme in the data that was extracted for the expert advisory panel. And the MRFF um, office, uh, provides each expert advisory panel with extensive data on the field that they are developing the roadmap for. So mental health is a very quickly emerging area. I mean, Australia bunches above its weight being fourth or fifth internationally for publications and citations, but we really need to build capacity. So EMCR led research um, was hotly debated in the expert advisory panel but also considered to be absolutely critical. So in the roadmap, in the implementation plan, um, you'll see the development um, as, of research workforce as being very important to that roadmap. 
And so in developing the grants and the plan, um, we also took that into account. So the top ranked grant and the top ranked EMCR led grant are funded in many of the calls in the Million Minds uh, research mission. So this is an EMCR grant, um, the definition of which is Chief Investigator A is an EMCR and more than 50% of the Chief Investigator team is um, early or mid-career researcher. So I think this was, a, I'm sure this was the first uh, mission to do this. Um, it was really reflected in the panels and the thoughts and the discussion from the the expert advisory panel. And it was also reflected in documents like the National Mental Health Research Strategy, um, which I also um, was involved with. So a major um, emphasis and one that I really would want people to think about if they're looking at um, investing in this area is to think about that EMCR focus and how we could build the capacity for more EMCRs to lead grants. And I think Jackie McDonald is talking a little bit um, later in the um, webinar, um, and she is one of the recipients of an EMCR. So that'll be a nice to hear from her. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you so much, uh, Marie. Thank you for a great overview. Um, look, there's just a couple of comments in Slido about some challenges with hearing. Um, I guess for those who can't hear, they may not hear me saying, please have a look um, within Slido because there's some hints about how to um, um, update your settings or your audio um, arrangements so that any issues will be resolved. Uh, so um, we'll now look at uh, consumer involvement in, in priority setting um, and just sort of within the context that within the MRFF we've been making effort to increase uh, and promote consumer involvement in, in all levels of research um, and this has included involving uh, consumers and those with lived experience in priority setting um, including for the research missions and the priority investments I just mentioned. So I'll now hand over to um, Shannon Calvert. So she was a member um, of the Million Minds Mental Health uh, Mission Expert Advisory Panel and also on the panel supporting the childhood mental health um, research investment. And she'll talk about her experiences of consumer involvement in priority setting. Before I do that, I just wanted to share the principles uh, for consumer involvement uh, in research that are used within the Medical Research Future Fund. And these were developed by our Medical Research uh, Future Fund Consumer Reference Panel uh, and published earlier this year. And the, the, um, the, the panel, the Consumer Reference Panel, provides advice to me and, and the broader MRFF team on strategies for improving our support for consumers um, in research design and implementation. The principles that you can see on the screen uh, set out that consumers uh, wish to be involved in all types and stages of research uh, they want to be partners with researchers um, and they want to be involved safely uh, and effectively. Um, it's also um, uh, important to note that cons the consumer panels also have a, has a really strong focus on diversity and, and equity. And so that's one of the principles that came through um, through that process. So I'll just hand over to Shannon now to talk about her experiences on, on these MRFF priority setting processes. Thanks very much, Marsha, and hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Shannon Calvert, and I'm joining you from Wajup Nangabuja here in Perth, Western Australia. Um, I also just want to acknowledge uh, the MRFF in um, recognising the importance of evolving in research and its understanding of what lived experience engagement looks like more broadly. So to that, also acknowledging and recognising my peers um, in the community. Um, yes, I sort of bring a, a more of a consumer lens to the space, but I know that there is such a rich, diverse community out there uh, from carers and families to siblings and kin. Um, and, and acknowledging that actually we all bring such a unique, rich lived experience um, into the space. And, and so I look forward to, to that evolving over time. Um, and, and so I'm so glad that you touched on the principles of consumer involvement, uh, Marsha, because it's really uh, interesting to come into the space as someone that is not a researcher and is not an academic and almost have this ex this expectation for myself, even to almost like an imposter sy a syndrome to to bring um, 
insight or sort of a perspective that's that's actually not uh, necessary or required. I think it's really important to bring the lens of of community and come in with 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 curiosity and um, and speak a different language, so to speak. Um, because I think what we're learning in the context of research is that it's fundamental. We establish ways in which we bring different expertise to complement um, the skills that uh, we all have. So whether it is um, the types and unique types of research, but ultimately at the end of the day, the, the focus is to enhance the quality of lives of Australians. And to do that and to uh, do that thoughtfully and, um, to be considerate in that process. Um, it's also then recognizing that we do at times have a great deal to learn um, and there's multiple factors that need to come into consideration. So I guess, you know, when we look at um, the setting of the priorities, it, it's always challenging when um, you're conscious of the multiple challenges that are faced by Australians experiencing mental health challenges and, um, none of us ever want to be in that position to pick or choose um, but at the same time there is a degree of accountability to recognize that there are voices that never get to come to the table um, that never get to advocate on their behalf and um, and so I think it's really important to actually say well we all have a role to to acknowledge that there is those needs out there in the community and how can we best ensure that not only do we further research in that sec in those spaces but also bring the people of the community alongside um, the process of research. To do research well, at the end of the day, it's understanding what the community needs, wants, and needs, has, you know, they need to learn and understand what it is that they're contributing towards. Um, there's nothing worse than ever going into a, a room and not understanding anything anyone is saying. But when we sort of collectively find a way to find, to meet a middle ground, um, it enhances the conversation and the richness of the conversation, even if at times um, we have to work through challenging and diverse perspectives. And so when I sort of came onto the expert advisory panel, I was really conscious of um, expertise I didn't bring, but then I also needed to acknowledge that th what I could bring was a lived experience lens or in terms of accountability to ensure that um, it wasn't about me or my experience, but um, being conscious of what we were missing in that process and and returning back into my community and peers to to hear and uh, recognize where they were there were more broader challenges in our communities and where people weren't being recognized. So I think the process of course in itself is you know very strategic to say the least. but I think what I was really encouraged over time coming in with a certain um, degree of vulnerability and almost this this wanting to sort of hold back and fear that I would may not use a language that um, is not contemporary to to the context of research um, I realized actually then it was my accountability if I put my hand up to say yes I would come on board that in fact I needed to bring that authenticity into the room so that we could establish really what is it that we need the community to understand because for the community to trust the process as well um, it's important to for them to acknowledge and see what is being done so that there is an extent of accountability because it is very challenging with people with mental health issues um, and concerns to trust the process when so many have been harmed along the way. Um, so these conversations emerged authentically in that in that process and there were times where I think it was about asking questions that I might have uh, raised um, diverse perspectives that others didn't understand and so um, I do want to acknowledge the consumer advisory panel because I think the process is also um, taking into account that how we do research well um, with people with lived experience and community has to be done thoughtfully and and in a considerate way. Um, and so to do that, I think those principles are fundamental and I would encourage everybody to um, to please explore those. It's not so much about saying, yes, I follow the principles and I know what they are. It's truly understanding what they mean. And I would um, implore people to actually go out to uh, lived experience advisory panels and, and groups out there to actually um, support your learning and understanding potentially as a research in terms of what those principles mean from, from both sides. So it's been an encouraging learning and uh, definitely a sector and a space in, uh, in the context of research, we are emerging and evolving 
um, I'm encouraged that we do actually have a lot more to learn. So as we start to bring more diverse perspectives to the table, it, it's starting to enhance the way we consider um, those priority populations, for example, and actually how it is that we need, to, you know, and what we need to do to um, to do research collectively and collaboratively as well. So it's not just about the community participating in research, but um, having an opportunity to do co-research as well. Um, so that was my touching on my examples, so my my experience um, initially, but um, it's certainly been a, a powerful learning for me. And I just wanted to thank the other um, the advisory panel members that I have learned a great deal from, but also their willingness to to sort of be in the gray with me as well. Thanks, Marsha. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so, so far, uh, we've talked about priorities at the Medical Research Future Fund um, and the initiative levels, uh, and we'll now move to how priorities are articulated at the grant opportunity level. And that's the level of which funding is allocated to research through grants. So in our office, uh, we review the medical research, um, the priorities and the initiative level priorities when we're developing grant opportunities. So section 1.3 of all of the guidelines set out what's to be achieved through the funding, and that's set out in the uh, objectives and the intended outcomes. And we always encourage researchers to take a close look at the guidelines, especially section 1.3 when considering whether and how to apply. And if there is a research plan or an implementation plan that the grant opportunity is enacting uh, through the funding mechanism, that's always referenced. Um, and we, we encourage people uh, to go back to those original documents to read them more broadly and understand what the expert panel was trying to achieve through the funding mechanisms. So I'll now hand over to Associate Professor Jackie McDonald. Uh, she'll talk through the process for her process for addressing the Million Minds Mental Health Mission priorities uh, for her MRFF funded project, uh, which was called One in Ten Men Informing Prevention of and Treatment for the Paternal Mental Health Problems. Well, thank you, Marsha, and thank you everybody for inviting me to be part of this today. Um, I'm Jackie McDonald from Deakin's School of Psychology and the Centre for Social and Early Emotional Development. And I'm also a convener of the Australian Fatherhood Research Consortium. Uh, I'm joining you today from Bunnell Land in Melbourne. And um, as was mentioned by Marie, my application was 50% EMCR led, for which I am extremely grateful that the MRFF made this a possibility. The call that I addressed was specifically for uh, incubator funding to conduct small scale developmental projects that would improve understanding of social determinants of mental health uh, and then inform the prevention of and treatment for uh, mental illness and psychological distress. And I had actually been keeping an eye on MRFF calls for the last couple of years and, and nothing stood out to me as precisely as this one as the right fit for the program of work that I do. Uh, I think the clear alignment uh, with this particular call is very important for the team's success. So to put this in context, uh, my work centres on men's and fathers' mental health from preconception to the early parenting years when we know that one in 10 men will experience psychological distress, hence the name of my project. Uh, and this occurs in the context of a system that was designed to provide reproductive and perinatal care for mothers and infants, but not fathers and the system is already stretched in supporting mothers. But the work in perinatal healthcare, um, the workers in perinatal healthcare know that when fathers have mental health problems, their partners and their children are also at significantly higher risk, but they're just not resourced or equipped to respond to everyone in the family. So against that context, um, I'm going to quickly draw attention to three key expectations noted in the scheme guidelines and, and the Million Minds Roadmap and Implementation Plan that I needed to bring together in a co into a cohesive plan. And these relate to, um, to knowledge generation, alignment of that knowledge to a critical issue and to partnerships. Um, so firstly, the call was for an understanding of social determinants of mental health problems. And this falls under aim one in the roadmap, which is to build a better understanding of the contributing factors of mental illness. So this is very much a knowledge generation aim. And, and that's perfect for me because my work is primarily with longitudinal cohorts. And these offer the best research design 
uh, to understand the antecedents and determinants of mental health problems. And I work within a wonderful team which has demonstrated this uh, advanced analytic capacity in cross cohort analyses and particularly in techniques that are useful for guiding public health advice. But secondly, in the guidelines, uh, it was stated that the project needed to uh, quote, to assess the potential and feasibility of, an, of novel strategies to address critical or intractable uh, health issues. So here the focus is on a critical health issue and on strategy more than knowledge generation. So for my project, this critical health issue was our failure to engage and support fathers with mental health concerns and a lack of evidence-based programs or infrastructure to facilitate change. Uh, and we needed to demonstrate in our application, the link between our knowledge generation and a strategy that would address the critical health issue. And then third, there's a full page in the guidelines encouraging strategic partnerships with health policy and healthcare delivery organisations. So bringing these points together, even though the call was for knowledge generation, it was also necessary uh, in our mind to demonstrate that this knowledge would become foundational in solving the critical health issue and that this solution would be generated with key strategic partners. And in my case, uh, that was with Movember and Healthy Mail, with whom I was already able to demonstrate emerging collaborations. Uh, so together, our team are now creating, uh, we're creating a Fatherhood Living Knowledge Bank of Evidence Reviews, a Fatherhood Life Course Research Alliance of Longitudinal Cohorts, and living guidelines for paternal preconception mental health care. That means they're updated regularly. Uh, I detailed in the application how these are foundational in building an evidence-based system of care for fathers from the ground up that will complement the parallel evolved system of care for mothers. But also my team of, of EMCRs and our wonderful mentors, uh, three of which already have um, NHMRC investigator grants, were each skilled in various components of the methodologies as well. Um, and as well as that, the living components of the knowledge bank and the guidelines that we're developing are augmented by new technologies and software supports uh, that will expedite the dissemination of evidence for translation. And I draw attention to those points in particular because they match criteria and principles within the guidelines and the roadmaps. Uh, in the application, um, one strategy that we used was under the descriptions of each project component, we listed evidence of the capabilities uh, and, and feasibility examples of prior works by our CIs, uh, work that was formative on the path to our particular project that we were putting forward here. And, and that was able, that was us showing that this didn't just spring out, out of thin air. Uh, and this was also a way to demonstrate the methodological skills and the leadership activities of the different members of the team. So very quickly, I'll also point out that um, we endeavoured to show that the application ticked off many of the principles of the Million Minds Mental Health Mission that you'll see outlined in the, in the roadmap document. And that is, uh, we have an interdisciplinary and international team. Our project is translational in nature. It responds to emerging trends. And to show this, we detailed international um, and Australian emerging policy and reproductive care and gender equality that showed where the project aligned with new directions. The project incorporates data sharing and harmonisation into its design and uses existing data and established frameworks. And that's actually a stated funding principle in the roadmap document. Uh, and as well as partners, the application detailed how our team would engage with consumer and expert reference groups to co-develop our guidelines with people with lived experiences of both receiving and providing care. So uh, I don't have much time, so I'll just finish with a final tip that I consider um, might be useful, and that's that we tended to use the language of the guidelines and the principles um, in the application. And we did this so that the reviewers would be left in no doubt that we were giving these full consideration. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank and acknowledge my full CI team, and I hope that these reflections are helpful and good luck to everybody with your future applications. Thanks, Marta. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, okay, so 
Um, this slide covers uh, the key considerations when applying to the uh, Medical Research Future Fund. Um, and you'll see on the slide a focus on the objective and intended outcomes that are set out in section 1.3 um, of, the, of the guidelines that I mentioned earlier. And, and these all link to the MRFF priorities and also the initiative priorities. We also have an evaluation strategy and framework which links to the broader MRFF strategy and in the, in the impact that the strategy sets the MRFF to achieve. Um, and we focus on this in the application and assessment process as we want to make sure that every MRFF funded grant is contributing towards the broader MRFF priorities. So I'll now hand over to Professor Michael Burke and he'll provide some reflections on how to develop uh, a grant application that can meet the priorities set for the MRFF and the initiative that you're applying to. His MRFF funded project is called um, the Mental Health Australia General Clinical Trial Network or MAGNET. Thank you very much, Marcia. So uh, I'm Michael Burke. I'm the director of the Impact Institute at Deakin University, which is a transdisciplinary research institute. So I'll be talking about how we wrote MAGNET to meet MRFF priorities. So we looked at the MRFF priorities and the number one MRFF priority, which is consumer research, resonated beautifully with what we were trying to achieve because uh, treatment, uh, inadequate treatments and is a major consumer priority. There's much literature out there that better and safer treatments is a priority. But we also looked at other MRFF priorities like translation and commercialization, uh, preventive health care as far as trials can inform this. Uh, we very strongly focused on health and medical research capability and capacity generation. Uh, we all, and lastly, we focused on mental health as a priority population, but also investing in subpopulations such as First Nations, uh, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, as particular foci. The way that we invested our resources uh, to meet these was also key. Uh, in as much as we have platform resources to assist trialists with things like assessments, but also we created platform resources to provide uh, consumer given, consumer driven input, as well as First Nations input into the design and implementation of studies. We are also mindful of MRFF strategic priorities, uh, and we are fortunate that the development of new therapeutics. Uh, with potential transformative inputs uh, was one of those, as well as the development of a skilled and sustainable medical research workforce with uh, expertise in translation and commercialization. So uh, that, that was certainly very helpful to us. So I'll tell you a little bit about Magnet. So we really have the vision of being a leading clinical trial network to generate high quality mental health trials that meet consumer and community needs. Prior to Magnet, there were no mental health clinical trial networks at all in, in mental health, which is a real, a, a massive shortfall given mental health is the largest burden of disability in the community. So our mission was really to unify and improve adult mental health clinical trial research and translation. And we wanted to create a reusable, sustainable and shared infrastructure to strengthen the capacity, the quality, and the effectiveness of mental health clinical trials. It was critical to us, for us at the get-go, to ensure that it was seen by the community as a resource that was created for their use and their benefit. Um, so we focused and prioritized transformative mental health research to address major mental health needs and unanswered questions. The kind of studies that can only be done through large scale trials requiring a collaborative network. And we learned a lot from other successful networks like the ANZIX and the ANZ Musk networks. We had values in terms of how we planned this, including the prioritization of collaboration, um, aiming for quality with integrity, inclusivity of our various community partners, transparency in terms of our processes and outputs, reciprocity with respect and mutual benefit for all, and an active process of community engagement and communication. 
So that's what we tried to do. And if you'll forgive me, I will highlight four idiosyncratic beliefs I have about how to draft a clinical trial that help us in guiding our clinical trials. Um, I'm, I, I'm a great believer in what Tolstoy wrote in Anna Karenina's Guide to Clinical Trials. Tolstoy wrote that all successful grants are alike and every unsuccessful grant is unsuccessful in its own way. There's really one way to get a good grant and you can fail in any of a myriad ways and the result is the same. Um, I think that the area which is the most important in putting together a grant application is creativity. Uh, you can spend an awful lot of time choosing the right outcome measure, but if the fundamental premise on which your idea is, or your grant application is based is insufficiently impactful, uh, you're not going to have traction. So uh, we, we work very hard at kicking the tires of the actual fundamental idea underpinning the grant, because that is where you're going to live or die. Um, another thing, another analogy which I find useful is the analogy of surfing. Uh, in order to catch a wave, you've got to get the timing right. We can all think of an idea where the idea is really just too early for the field to be ready for it. And unquestionably, if you catch the wave too late, you're just going to be dumped into the mud. So you have to time your idea with where the field is ready and where the process and program is ready for your idea. You can't catch it too early and you can't catch it too late. Another very idiosyncratic idea is uh, something we borrow from the NIH system, which is the value and importance of an NIH specific aims page. So the NIH mandates that your page one of the grant should be written in a very formulaic way. You've got to have an opening with a hook and stating where your knowledge is, what the gaps are, what's the critical need. You've got to talk to the who, why, and what of your grant. What's your goal? What's your rationale? What's your objective? You need to define your aims very clearly, your aims and hypotheses, and your payoff. Uh, what reinforces the need for a NIH style specific aim page as your page one is when you send your grant round to your colleagues to review, you're going to get huge amounts of edits to your first paragraph, quite a lot of edits to page one in general, and nobody is ever going to edit page eight of your grant. And that's how reviewers read them. If your page one is not great, you're dead in the water. Uh, what the cliche I use is you get all your brownie points on your first page by having the idea right. And from pages two to eight, you can only lose points because your pilot data is not right, your stats isn't right, your health economics isn't right, etc. So the critical page is page one. Uh, the other thing that we were very focused on in terms of uh, our magnet grant is looking at sustainability, which is a major challenge for us in running a clinical trial network. It's one thing to get a, a network started, but we've needed to face the challenge of how we maintain sustainability at the uh, when the grant the grant itself winds down, but there it, you know I, I think I've used my time so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about this issue. Thank you, Michael. Um, so um, consumer involvement in proposed projects is a key part of the MRFF assessment process. And this slide shows how consumer um, involvement is embedded in the three weighted assessment criteria. And it also shows that we have additional assessment components uh, for any research that involves the priority populations that are laid out in the, um, in the slide. So I'll now pass back to Shannon to talk about um, the role of consumers in uh, research projects. Thanks, thanks, Marsha. And I think um, you know this is a, this is a topic I'm incredibly passionate about because I think we're all learning in the process. So um, I don't think any of us come with um, you know a way of knowing that we can do it perfectly. But it's really important that we collectively determine ways in which we we work with each other and potentially bring people with lived experience and those from the community um, as part of the research and not just participating in the re research. And look, I acknowledge that there is so much, so much to learn in this this process. We hear the co-design and co-production word um, a great deal. Um, 
but I think ultimately at the end of the day, if you maintain transparency and authenticity with those that you are um, hoping to collaborate with, I think ultimately at the end of the day, there's a, there's a trust, trust that can be built there to determine um, the process rather than you feeling this pressure on yourself potentially as a researcher to figure it out on your own. Um, and so I think there's a lot to be said about learning and upskilling around how we can do this collectively moving forward. And by do this, I mean uh, work in, in collaborative ways. Um, I guess in, you know, the role of consumers in research is, is really paramount and we're learning this, uh, but the role of lived experience more broadly as well. We acknowledge that, you know, there's not enough uh, research being done for carers and families or for even for siblings. But if you look at uh, the priority populations, uh, the Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, older people experiencing disease of aging, and people with rare or currently untreatable diseases and conditions and those in remote and rural communities. If you think even in that sort of cohort, the unique and the uniqueness and diversity within that cohort um, is, is so critical to take into consideration because one voice will never be the same as every voice. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that there will be diverse needs. Um, and to that, I think it's about ensuring that the perspectives, experience and the needs of individuals um, directly affected by these priority areas are integral to that actual research process. Um, so there's multiple ways in which uh, you can engage with lived experience. And um, and as I was touching on the sort of the, the consideration of co-design and co-production, although that is ultimately the most um, positive way in terms of sharing that perspective, it's also, a, you can also do really good consultation. It's just knowing what you can and versus what you can't, you can't do in scope. But I guess the consultation is that fundamental form of involvement. Um, it will entail um, seeking input from, from those in the community to actually understand um, their perspectives on how they understand research priorities uh, and methodologies. Um, we look at the concept of translation and ultimately, can we say to people in the, on the street, this is what we're doing and this is why it's important because if they can't understand, I think we need to take a step back and find that middle ground to make sure that there's a shared understanding of the importance of this research and the research that you're conducting. It's always tricky to listen actively and, and value the lived experience of those who navigate um, complex um, it, complexities within the healthcare system. But I wholeheartedly feel and confident that people will be very willing and open to, to learning with you and supporting that process. And so it's about that, it's not just about lived experience learning from researchers, but I think it's fundamental for researchers to learn from those in the lived experience and community. I guess the more sort of deeper step is collaboration, which obviously is that level of involvement where um, we now have people from the community um, and with the lived experience that is specific to the type of research that you're doing, who are working alongside you um, to do that research. And it starts to get to more of the, the co-research opportunity. Um, this, this is a partnership now, and this is where it's more inclusive, it's holistic, um, and it ensures that the outcomes resonate with um, the realities actually faced by um, those that you are focusing your research on. We do talk about consumer controlled research, which um, I guess is represents a powerful paradigm shift. Um, I think now we actually start to bring people from the community to take leading roles. Um, and these are opportunities. It's not where people have to wear, it's not the expectation that people wear both hats. And I think it's providing opportunity that we don't initiate people wearing multiple hats, but we provide and capacity build people in the community to actually come in and start to co-lead that research process as well. Bearing in mind that there's a lot to learn from both sides, but it's about people participating in your study design and the implementation. Um, and this approach, I think, empowers people from the community as well to shape the research agenda with you um, and will very much allow for the opportunity to, to enhance that the work that you do is more person-centered as opposed to being patient or clinically centered or medically centered. I guess in the context of the MRF um, priorities, aligning lived experience involvement with these research um, opportunities contributes to that um, effectiveness and relevance of the study. So that is absolutely important. And knowing and understanding what lived experience engagement looks like on multiple levels. There'll be some that will bring expertise on implementation of advisory groups and working groups. But I think it's important to ensure that the research directly addresses the needs of those priority populations because ultimately if you don't do that, the outcomes on, will, I would argue they'd be more applicable and impactful. 
So I guess, um, you know, the, the closing of that is the involvement of, of people from the community and those with lived experience and research projects is not and cannot be a checkbox um, process. Um, it is just a fundamental necessity and it's it's about us all coming to the to the um, act being accountable and recognizing the inherent values of people with diverse perspectives um, from lived experience and those that actually are living with um, the challenges, especially those in the priority areas. And we are learning more from our young people, from our children, um, how mental health challenges and complex needs are um, are advancing. So it's not people that are complex, it's their circumstances in the world that we live in and the dynamics that, that we have to face. And so as we sort of move forward, I think without acknowledging that our world will be incredibly diverse and continue to be, um, we always need to be um, sort of on the top of the, our game to consider the needs of the people that we are focusing on when we're doing our research. Um, so I guess collectively, I think we all have the same priority. We all hope to um, enhance the true progress um, in, in the research process. But then ultimately, I think to do that, it will be about integrating the voices, but it's not even just the voice, the insights of those that we aim to to serve and support um, and to improve their quality of life. And so um, I think if you use the opportunity to step back and explore what genuine engagement will look like for you, um, undoubtedly um, the outcomes will be far richer um, and certainly enhance the lives of um, many Australians as well. Thank you. Great, thank you uh, so much, um, Shannon, for the, um, for the update um, or for the for the commentary, I just um, want to quickly throw to um, Caroline just to offer her um, a quick opportunity just to give a bit of a summary or an overview of what you've heard um, from the panelists and, and any of your thoughts. Thank you so much, Marsha, and thank you to fantastic panelists. And I can see lots of questions coming in as well. Um, I mean, I think you've heard some uh, specific information about the priorities and the, the missions or the expert advisory panels. Marie certainly talked through this and, and Shannon as well. And I think that's really helpful to understand where these things come from. Um, but I guess you also heard some very nice general advice about grant writing, particularly from Jackie and Michael, I think. And, and Jackie really talked about the importance of looking at the objectives, the outcomes, the eligibility, sections um, and really reading those documents. I know we're all in a hurry when we're writing a grant. We haven't got time to read all the documents. We just want to write the grant. But I encourage you to spend a couple of hours on the NH on the MRFF and the NHMRC websites just looking at the documents, looking at what you're doing, you're writing for before you hit that keyboard, um, I think. I thought Michael's comment about timing was really good, and that's really relevant for the priorities. It may not be your time. The priorities may not fit your studies at the moment, and you may be better off spending this next year or so or two years uh, doing all the other sort of work to get to get in the best place for when for when the the right grant comes along. I, and I also really like the advice about making it easy for the reviewers and thinking about your reviewers. And the reviewers now include consumers or lived experience advocates. So yes, you have to write technical language, but make it easy for the reviewers. Write that first page. I love that, Michael, the first one page to get people engaged and then think about your readers. Frankly, we're usually reading them late at night or after a long day. Um, and sometimes with a glass of wine. So make it easy for your reviewers, make it that they just are so engrossed that they can't stop reading. Um, and get lots of peer review from your friends, from your colleagues, from people out of your field as well, I think. Um, don't wait for your feedback at a grant review panel, get that before you go into the grants. Um, so thanks everybody, Marsha. I know we're running out of time, but over to you to just take some of the questions. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And and this one I might throw to you, um, Michael. Um, so it's the most popular question so far. Um, can you give us some examples or maybe one example given the time or some ideas around what meaningful consumer involvement might look like for basic science? Um, so if, if I can throw to you on that one. That is such an important question, and it's one that we really have grappled with because 
you know, we understand it in our network, if you're doing a study on trauma, that resonates, that makes sense. If you're studying calcium cal calmodulin kinase too, you're going to have trouble. So you need to engage consumers at the level of which the fundamental mission of the project resonates with consumer needs. So calcium calmodulin kinase 2 may not resonate easily, but if the if you can create a re resonance with why this regulatory protein might light at the heart of a disorder that you're trying to solve that is a major burden or disability, you need to understand you need to sell that and you need to communicate that. Uh, and then we often find that we get very useful input for consumers, uh, even though the idea itself might be rather arcane because there are many points of intersection and many points of resonance with where consumers need to provide input into this or how this is going to impact consumers or how they might think that the project might be framed. Uh, and so we've got incredibly useful input, even in relatively arcane fields, but uh, it, it's a really complex issue. Um, we need to get this right. We need to get input where the priorities are most tightly resonant and we don't want to compromise preclinical research because the resonance isn't obvious. So that's a tightrope we have to walk and it's one that we really struggle with. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, so I might just quickly take the next question because it's a little bit more uh, sort of a program one. Uh, is there a reason why we receive no feedback all, at all on non-successful grants? Hard to know how to improve with no feedback. Um, just to let everyone know that uh, we have been able to implement a process with Business Grants Hub for the grants that they assess on or they support assessment of through uh, for the MRFF and, and feedback is provided um, to all applicants, um, successful and unsuccessful. Um, we have been working with NHMRC for a while now, asking for implementation of a, of a feedback uh, model, and that's something that they're looking at for us. So recognise this is a really important issue uh, and that keeps being raised with us, but just want to let people know that it's on our radar and we are working actively with NHMRC to introduce um, a feedback system. Um, I might ask uh, you this one, Marie. Um, so if a grant call doesn't specify that the CIA must be an e EMCR, can EMCRs be successful in applying as a CIA in more general calls if they can demonstrate strong support from a team with co-CIs with more well-established track records? And I'll just pipe in and say it does happen. It happens quite a bit in the MRFF that our um, EMCR uh, uh, successful grantees are early to mid-career researchers, but I'll hand over to you, Marie, to respond in a more wholesome way. Thanks, um, Marsha. And um, yes, absolutely. Um, we did see that. Um, it, we wanted to um, supercharge that, actually. That's why in the Million Minds mission, <clears throat> it was the case that the top funded grant and the top funded ECR grant are um, would be um, successful, sorry, the top rated ECR grant would be successful. But we also knew that both of those, you know, the top rated grant could be led by an ECR. So it might be that the, you know, in any call, the two grants that get funded are both funded by ECRs. Um, I would just harp back to what Michael and also what um, Jackie said, it's the idea and it's the creativity that should um, count. And um, if you've then got a backup of your team, then in the, in the general funding round, then, you know, those things ticked, you have a really good chance of being successful. But I, I know it does happen, Marsha, but it is it is a tough field. It's a tough mm. space. And it is really hard when you're EMCR and you're 10 years out from your PhD. That's why we wanted to make sure some rounds were specifically targeted to um, EMCR-led research. Great. Thank you so much, Marie. And we're right on three o'clock, um, everyone. So I'll just take a moment um, to wrap up. I'd really like to um, thank uh, my co-host, Caroline Homer, and also the wonderful panel for all of the great insights um, that they were able to share with us. And thank you to everyone for attending and asking some really great questions as well. Uh, the webinar will be made available, uh, including the slide deck, that was a question, uh, will be made available on the health website shortly. 
Thank you all again and look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you.